On this edition of Primetime Politics, we'll hear from the New Brunswick MP, Jenica Atwin, on why she decided to leave the Green Party and cross the floor to sit with the Liberals. Our panel of MPs will talk about the dying days of the spring sitting of Parliament as the probability of a fall election continues to grow. And our journalist panel will look at the G7 summit and Canada's promise of vaccines for poorer countries, as well as the politics of party defections and election countdowns. But we start with the ever-strengthening drumbeat of a possible fall federal election. The Trudeau government is accusing the opposition of obstructing the passage of key pieces of legislation. The opposition parties are arguing that that's just how a minority parliament works. Joining me now are three MPs from the different parties. Kevin Lamoureux is the Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Privy Council, and he's a Liberal MP for Winnipeg North. Blake Richards is the Conservative Party Whip and the MP for the Alberta riding of Banff Airdrie. And Rachel Blaney is the NDP Whip and member for the BC riding of Powell River, North Island. All three of you, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Okay, Kevin Lemoyer, I'm going to ask the question that everyone's asking. Are we headed inevitably for a fall election? Well, you know, I'm going to stick to what the, the Prime Minister says and uh, other members of my caucus. Our focus uh, continues to, to be uh, the pandemic and uh, bringing forward uh, uh, legislation that's necessary in order to get us through this. Uh, there's also some very progressive legislation that we're hoping to be able uh, to, to pass. Uh, I know that the opposition parties uh, spend a great deal of time speculating on the election. Uh, for us, uh, we want to uh, continue to get us through uh, this, uh, the pandemic. Okay, so let's walk through some things that we did learn this week. Your House Leader, Pablo Rodriguez, has identified at least four priority bills that he says your government needs to get passed. One is an obvious one, the budget implementation bill. Then there's the bill to uh, ban conversion therapy, Bill C-6. There's an environmental framework or an accountability bill, a net, uh, net zero bill, C-12. And there's also the bill on public broadcasting, Bill C-10. He's identified all four of those as priorities. When will your Liberal government draw the line and say these aren't coming, they're not going to pass, it's time for an election? Do you have to get all four well, of them passed? What's, what's the uh, trade-off here? Well, we're not going to give up. All four of these pieces of legislation are absolutely essential. The budget one is the most obvious. The other three pieces, whether it's the net zero on the environment or the conversion therapy or the broadcasting, the modernization of broadcasting over 30 years in, in need, these are very important progressive pieces of legislation. And because of the destructive uh, force from the Conservative Party on the floor of the House of Commons, uh, they, they're going out of their way to prevent any anything from passing. So we're going to, to look to our progressive uh, uh, partners uh, that are prepared to assist us in recognizing the value of this legislation and try to get it passed. That's the reason why we attempted to bring forward a motion to get uh, extended hours, which will come to a vote uh, next week. Uh, we're not scared to put in the hours that are necessary in order to, to, to do this work for, for Canadians. Okay. Um, Blake Richards, on behalf of the Conservatives, it's sort of a double barrel question. One, you're being accused of obstructing. But two, when you look at these four priority pieces of legislation that the government has earmarked, we just mentioned, when you look at two of them, Bill C-6, banning conversion therapy, and Bill C-12 on a net zero environmental accountability framework, a very important bill, are you concerned that if they don't pass, you're giving the government something to hammer you over the head with if they call an election? They can then point to something very important in terms of social values and accuse you of being social conservatives and something important on the environment and accuse you of being anti-environment. These are, cr these are systematically chosen to make it difficult. Well, I, I guess I'd give a two-part answer to that, Martin. For, first of all, you know, any, any trouble the government is having getting, getting their legislation passed is, is of their own making. Uh, I know they want to try to find ways to, to uh, you know, blame it on others. Uh, but, you know, Parliament is designed to make sure that bills are scrutinized, to make sure that, uh, that you know, there is proper debate. And those, that debate happens in, in two different ways. It happens in the House of Commons, but it also happens in the parliamentary committees. And as, as many people know, the Liberals have been filibustering in a number of committees for, for months now. Uh, and they're holding up the ability for those committees to do their work. Uh, so, you know, if they, if they want to point their fingers at somebody, they should point the fingers at themselves. Um, their legislation could be getting through if they had not prorogued parliament, if they had not filibustered at all these parliamentary committees. So if they want to blame anyone, they should blame themselves. We will continue to do our jobs to make sure that we 
uh, you know, bring forward the points that Canadians want us to bring forward. Uh, no one wants to obstruct anything from uh, from happening. I mean, we want to look at bills and determine whether they're good legislation, bad legislation, and we'll we'll make decisions, uh, on, on, you know, on how we vote and etc. on on those things. But at the end of the day, if the government wants to point fingers at anyone here, they need to point the fingers at themselves. Okay, Ra uh, Rachel Blaney, I want to ask you, what do you make of the government's prioritization of these four bills uh, and the state of affairs with the opposition being accused of, uh, of obstructing? Well, it is extremely frustrating. These are some very important bills, uh, especially when I look at things like having the the environmental framework in place. The NDP worked really hard to get it to be a little bit better. So we want to see these things passed. Uh, quite honestly, though, it's, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. We've seen both the Conservatives and the Liberals filibustering in different committees, causing these challenges. We need to get work done because Canadians are asking us to get this work done. So what I hope to see is more of a collaborative attitude, but the, it's sort of one of these challenges because we've got the Liberals saying, oh, we're not saying that there's going to be an election in the fall, but we're doing everything we can to prepare for an election in the fall, including pushing this legislation through. And then we have the Conservatives disrupting again and again. Uh, we need to get the work done done. That is why we are here. One of the things that is good about minority governments is that there's multiple levels of power and collaboration, which allows, I think, for more fair uh, processes and legislation that reflects Canadians better. So I hope that there isn't an election in the fall. COVID, of course, has taken a huge toll on our communities. I don't think this is a good time to be tossing that on top of everything else. When I look at the tourism industry in my riding, for example, we really just need to support them so that they're still here when this is done, uh, having an election is not helpful. In okay, that way. Kevin Lemur, where I guess the ultimate argument that comes from the opposition parties is that there should be no rush to this in the sense that if your government, it will be your government that will cause this legislation to die on the order paper if you call an election. That the debate and the rush into the debate of these priority pieces of legislation all could be done at a good pace. But if things don't get finished, you can be back to it in the first week of September or whenever you come back in September. Um, that you're looking for a pretext to call an election. Well, I, I don't buy into that uh, because at the end of the day, you know, you don't have an option when it comes to Bill C-30. And let's use Bill, sorry, a tangible example. Yesterday, uh, we were supposed to be debating Bill C-30. Instead, the first thing the Conservatives do is they move an adjournment motion to prevent with the idea of stopping the House for the day, uh, causing votes and bells and, and so forth. And then uh, we have to go to orders of the day. The Conservatives then stand up on privilege issues uh, and argue endlessly on matters that are not uh, based on privilege. Uh, and at the end of the day, every hour that is used up through their games, that destructive force, we lose the opportunity to have members then speak on the legislation. And then the conservatives will criticize us for not allowing them to have enough members to speak on the legislation. They're being hypocritical. The excuses that Mr. Richard has given is very lame at best. Uh, there is a great deal of frustration because the government genuinely wants to see this important legislation passed before the House rises. It is right. nothing outside the norm. Okay, but I'm just uh, right. But I want to interrupt. I mean, just in two words, though. One thing is for sure: you're going to have extended hours next week. Uh, so for the next eight uh, eight days, you're going to have eight days to go. Extended hours in the evenings once you decide on it on Monday. Uh, the C30 granted the budget implementation bill has to be passed, as do the supplementary estimates. But all of these other pieces of legislation can be debated at a regular pace and get to them and try and finish them, but it's this axe hanging over the head of everything in terms of a potential election. If you go to previous parliaments, you'll see that all legislation doesn't pass at the end of a particular mandate. Yeah. This is important pieces of legislation in which we have declared that. We've been talking about it uh, for a long time now. We expect and we're hopeful that we'll get support, at least from uh, progressive-minded okay. uh, parties, to see it okay. ultimately pass before summer breaks. Okay, I want to ask uh, Blake, uh, Blake Edwards, uh, Blake Edwards, Blake Richards. Blake uh, Richards, you've been uh, both sides, both the NDP and the Liberals are accusing you of, in a way, playing into the government's hand, of uh, being when you delay and when you are, are allegedly obstructive, that you're playing into the government's hand, uh, it, you're feeding their narrative of, of a necessary election. 
Well, you know, uh, I think what what, stri- what strikes me here is like we're we're trying to make sure that the parliamentary committees can 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 do the work that they're there to do, and we've seen this systematic liberal filibuster. And to try to cover up things, and then even to cover up the cover ups in some cases. And you know, Mr. Lamoureux calls that lame. Well, I, I frankly will say that Canadians expect the parliamentary committees to be able to do their work. You know, there was they their, their uh, tactics they've been using here uh, caused the the cancellation of committees. Okay. For example, we had a committee that was bringing in uh, you know Indigenous uh, business owners to talk about some of the problems that they have with government programs. Okay, so last question. Name that Indigenous business owners wanted to come in and talk about their their problems with the government. New immigrants was another committee that they canceled okay, where they the wanted last, to come in and talk about the last issues question. With the government. Is that lame? I don't think that's lame at all. I mean, this government has the ability to to allow uh, Parliament to work if it wants to. It also has the has has the time to pass these things if it would just stop filibustering. Okay. Um, Rachel, uh, are you worried that Canadians will forget once the election has been called, they'll forget about being angry about an election being called? Well, I, you know, all I have to say is there are some major concerns. You know, for example, today in the House of Commons, I brought up the reality that with Bill C-30, what we're going to see is Canadians that are receiving the CRB are going to be getting $800 less a month. We are in the middle of a pandemic. We have hopeful horizon, but we need to make sure that families are okay during this time. So to have an election because people are making both sides, the Liberals and the Conservatives, making all these political mandates, these dramas, we need to get to work for Canadians. Okay, I want to thank all three of you for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The Green Party of Canada lost one of its three members of Parliament to the Liberals. On Thursday, the party's first ever MP from New Brunswick, Jenica Atwin, announced she was crossing the floor, leaving the Green Caucus after what has turned into a fractious and nasty debate over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Joining me now is Jenica Atwin, the former Green member and now the Liberal member of Parliament for Fredericton. Ms. Atwin, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. Sure, happy to be here. Um, I'm going to ask because this is important to your constituents. There's still a certain amount of confusion in the air uh, about why you stepped down. Your former leader, Annamie Paul, Green Party leader, says you didn't leave the party because of a disagreement over her leadership or her party's stand uh, on Israel-Palestine. Is that true? No. Um, and, I, and I just want to be as respectful as I can. I, I don't want to leave on bad terms. I, I have, you know, I, I wish everyone well. Um, I just, but Yes, that's the reason that I left. Okay, what was it then? Uh, was it her position? Um, she called for a de-escalation in the conflict and for both sides to return to negotiations in the Israel-Palestine conflict in Gaza. Um, was it her statement or was it the statement by her now former senior advisor, Noah Zatman? Well, you know, I, I, healthy debate is, is wonderful. It's ideal. It's how we get good policy. So it's, it's not about her position at all. Um, and it's about what came out of, uh, you know, the, the lack of communication around reaching, uh, you know, perhaps a, an understanding. Um, and certainly Mr. Zatzman complicated things in a, in a big way, um, you know, publicly attacking me. And it hasn't been easy. Um, so it's a, it was a decision that I made uh, that did not come lightly. Many sleepless nights. Um, a lot of thought went into this. And uh, again, for my constituents, I hope to prove to them that I'm still me. I'm still able to do the work that I came here to do. My values are the same. Okay, I want to ask you, the, the, um, so it was, it was his, what's construed as a threat. He said, we will work to defeat you in, and bring in progressive climate champions who are Antifa and pro-LGBT and pro-Indigenous sovereignty and Zionists. Uh, was it that statement that made the difference? Well, I mean, that certainly was the catalyst. Even from there, I think we could have, you know, worked through conflict. Um, I, I was open to that, um, but it, it didn't happen. Um, so, yes, uh, unfortunately, I don't meet all of the criteria of that list. Um, and I, I just, it was difficult for me to do my work in that environment. I have to ask, um, the Liberal Party's position is not that far from your leader's position, your former leader, the, the Green Party's position, uh, Annamie Paul. I'm calling for de-escalation, calling for respect on both sides, calling for a two-state solution, uh, calling for respect of Israel's right to exist and security, and calling for the sovereignty and uh, self-determination of the Palestinians. That is what Annamie Paul wants, and that is what the Liberal Party official policy is. Are you going to be comfortable with the Liberal Party's position on Israel-Palestine? 
Well, you know, we've, we've had conversations um, about this and about my stance, and it's very clear to me that there are other colleagues in the House, uh, in the Liberal Party, that would support my views, but also support the idea that we can work towards, um, again, understanding. Uh, healthy debate is important, and uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to work on a team. There are many voices that have different perspectives, but it's about respect and it's about collaboration. Um, so regardless if we if we differ uh, in our opinions, I hope to go in and to be able to, to voice my, my voice in a way that's going to be respected. Okay, your two um, former colleagues, uh, Elizabeth May and uh, Paul Manley. Uh, Paul Manley was quoted as uh, taking a similar position as yours on the Middle East question. Uh, both of them decided to stay in the caucus and not to leave. Uh, they see they're heartbroken by your decision. Was it easier for you? But was this decision made easier by an offer from the Liberals? Have they offered you the seat? Are you going to get the nomination for Fredericton? Um, I, I will have the nomination for Fredericton. Um, it certainly is is part of that. Again, to see one door closing and one door opening uh, feels feels better than being kind of left out in the cold. Uh, Elizabeth and Paul will be my friends forever. I have nothing but love and respect for them. Um, it's devastating for me as well. I'm, I'm just as heartbroken. I never intended for this to happen. Ms. Uh, Paul also said that your discussions with the Liberals predated uh, this disagreement about the Middle East. Is that true? No, that's not true. Okay. Um, now, your constituents, you know, uh, I, we were campaigning with you in Fredericton. They're going to ask about positions you took as a Green Party candidate on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, on the government's, uh, you criticized the Trudeau government for abandoning electoral reform, on fracking, on climate action. You said the not enough movement, uh, even on reconciliation. Uh, how are you going to be able to campaign for the Liberals now when you, you criticize them as recently as just after the last budget, saying that they had given up on an ambitious plan for the future? What are you going to say to your constituents? Well, that all of those views stand. Um, I'm going in to be a fighter. I'm going to try this to work with government to see if I'm sitting at the same table, if I can be more effective. Um, you know, I've, 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 the last two years, everything I've ever said uh, in the House, in my statements and speeches, um, all true. I would never say something that I didn't firmly believe with my whole heart, and that remains the same. You know, openly critical of the liberal approach to, to many issues, but again, I'm here to work with a team who is accepting me for my difference of opinion and wants to work with me towards, you know, what could be a better future for Canadians that would include that perspective that I bring to the table. So uh, the proof will be in the work that I put in, um, but I'm going in to fight and to be heard. Okay. Um, we were in your riding for several days, and the dynamic of your victory was quite exceptional. Uh, it was a tight three-way race. I mean, just a few percentage points. The Liberals and the Conservatives have held that riding quite often. Very tight race. One of the big factors was a local MLA, David Kuhn, who's also the leader of the Greens in New Brunswick. He is a powerhouse. He helped you get elected. I remember you admitting that. His personal popularity and his uh, help in campaigning. Uh, there's a great student vote. There's a great Green vote. He says he's regretting your decision to leave the Greens. Uh, you made the wrong choice, according to him. Uh, are you concerned about uh, losing that whole Green constituency in the riding? I mean, absolutely. Um, again, it's going to take a lot of repair uh, for relationships on the ground. That's, that's work that I knew would come with this decision. Um, you know, David, I still love and care for him deeply. Um, he's been such an important role in my journey, and I hope that at some point we can continue that, you know, personal relationship as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's it's tough. I just, I hope I can reiterate that this, this decision was not made lightly. I considered, you know, every aspect of the, you know, the questions that you're asking me, absolutely. Um, so it's just, I'm going to have to prove that I'm strong enough um, to make sure that this was the right decision. You're going to be asked all these questions on the doorstep in the next election. Absolutely. And you know what? You know, be, being worried about election, um, that's kind of gone in that I, I want the opportunity to speak to everyone face to face to explain, uh, you know, my reasonings, explain that my priorities uh, remain the same, what I'm going to do, what I see as a potential for opportunity here. Um, so I say, you know, bring it on. I'm ready for those okay. tough conversations. Last question that everyone's asking. You were speaking with Dominique Leblanc yesterday. He helped uh, introduce you as a new liberal candidate. Did he give you any inkling as to when the election will happen? Uh, no, not really. Just everyone kind of has this feeling that it's, it potentially could be in early fall. Um, and so that's kind of what I am expecting. But no, I don't think Dominic knows either when it might be. All right. I want to thank you very much. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you so much, Martin.
Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is attending the G7 summit in Cornwall, England this weekend. Already at the summit, President Joe Biden has announced that the U.S. will begin providing 500 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to poorer countries. U.K. Prime Minister and summit host Boris Johnson says his country will ship 100 million doses. And there are reports that Canada will commit to 100 million doses to needy countries. But the details are still to be announced. But there will be no negative impact on the vaccination plan uh, for Canadians within Canada. Joining me now are two members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Mia Rabson is a parliamentary reporter for the Canadian Press, and Katie O'Malley is a contributor to iPolitics. Both of you, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, let's start with the G7. We are getting indications that Canada is making a commitment uh, f to vaccines for the poorer countries. We're being told it could be about 100 million doses, but we don't know exactly what form the commitment will take. Uh, Mia, you've been following the COVID file for 15 months now. What are you watching for? Well, we're looking for specifics. At this point, Canada is the only G7 country that hasn't really put any specifics on the table about how many doses of vaccine we're going to donate. Okay. Uh, it's it's bizarre in the sense that they have said at many times, we'll donate the doses. We know we will have excess doses. We have bought more doses per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, so it, they have been sort of very slow to explain how many they're going to provide, even though they have been a huge supporter of this, of COVAX, and this facility that was established to make sure there was vaccine equity. Karina Gould, our, our international development minister, is a co-chair of that of that initiative. And yet Canada is still just weirdly not saying right. exactly what they plan to do on doses. They've given a lot of money but to buy doses, but it's not like there's doses okay. down the street that they can COVAX can turn to and buy. They actually need countries like Canada that are well ahead on the vaccine front to donate doses. And now Canada stands alone without any details. We're Do supposed we to finally get some of those details on Sunday, um, but a lot remains to be seen as to when they're going to be sent. And I mean, we hear from Trudeau, you hear from many people all of the time. We aren't getting out of this pandemic without the whole world right. getting out of this pandemic. If it continues to spread elsewhere and new variants emerge, we will be in potentially deep trouble if the vaccines are avoided by these new variants. So it is a critical issue, not just to help the rest of the world morally, but also for our own self-interest it actually will help okay and we'll have to see at what point they define when we have a hit a surplus that we can start donating uh, i want to get to a really amazing political story this week because it's a juicy political one jenica atwin um, that big breakthrough in new brunswick for the green party leaving the green party to walk across the floor and join as a liberal mp uh, so they, she's the new liberal mp for fredericton what do you make of it all katie uh, this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, the Green Party has been having some internal difficulties, I think is probably the most diplomatic way to say it, for the last, oh gosh, month or so. And actually, some of that uh, was specifically related to Jenica Atwin and her comments, or actually her reaction to some of the party's positioning on the conflict in the Middle East and the most recent developments there. Right. Um, there was sort of a, a, a bit of a tussle, an online hustle when the uh, the, the leader's uh, press secretary put up a note on his Facebook that seemed to actually be threatening to try to replace her due to her views. Uh, her, she's very strongly pro-Palestinian. Uh, that created this uh, almost a rift between the leader and her office, enemy Paul and her office, and the rest of the party and some of the grassroots. And there's been all this intrigue playing out at the executive level with the federal council. Uh, I mean, it's been sort of past the popcorn in terms of the, uh, the antics and the action that was going on. But I don't think anyone saw this coming in terms of of that uh, yeah. the dramatic act of crossing the floor, which is really something you don't, it usually happens maybe once a parliament, if that, and it's definitely something that given the uh, context and everything that was going on was absolutely uh, uh, kind of took Ottawa by storm this week. How, how serious a blow is it though for the Green Party? I mean, because for example, you have Annemie Paul saying, this is not a vote on my, my leadership. Uh, and yet she, well, you have her senior advisor who's had to step down because of his involvement in this, in this, in this tiff. Now you, she's losing an MP, one of three MPs. Yeah, it's 33% of her caucus, as you know, a wag might point out. And in, in terms of the enemy Paul is still a relatively recent um, leader in the sense that she's only been sort of getting her uh, her feet wet and getting positioned and getting hold of the party for, I guess, a little a little less than a year now. And that's really not a lot of time to take on a party machine that has been very well established and has a lot, had a lot of entrenched interests and different sort of competing sub niches even before she got there. I'm not sure she realized quite to what degree that was the case. And it might be true that she underestimated um, 
the uh, I guess the passion with which and the severity that this mm -hmm. this tussle between her now former MP and her own uh, communications director would have. But yeah, it's it's hard to see this as anything, frankly, other than uh, a shot, not necessarily at her leadership, but maybe the way the party has been handling this whole situation. I know that uh, Paul Manley and Elizabeth May put out a statement a day after saying that they were heartbroken at the loss of their colleague and actually kind of seeming to lay at least some of the blame for that on the leader's office. Yeah. So definitely not a great situation in Greenland. I think it also goes to, it, it underlies what we already knew was the case, but may as well point it out again. It's really hard to lead a party if you're not in the House of Commons. Yeah. It just becomes logistically a very difficult thing to do, both in terms of, of your physical presence, but also having that influence of that day-to-day, -day, you know, back and forth with your members, which it, you're not necessarily yeah. going to get when you're holding, you know, you only see them when you hold Zoom conferences with them. Uh, Mia, what do you make of that? I mean, this is it's so replete in different dimensions to this story, what it means for the Liberals, what it means for Jenica Atwin in terms of her chances of re-election. She's going to be the Liberal candidate. What it means for the Green party where do you go with this this is another symptom of the debate over the Middle East and the uh, Palestine Israeli conflict uh, it seems to have taken and caused uh, you know yet more more problems the conservatives are already attacking the new MP Jenica Atwin the new liberal MP saying that uh, uh, Justin Trudeau they say is now welcoming an anti-Israel MP what do you make of it all well, the interesting thing to me in all of this, and I mean, there's many things that are interesting, to be honest, is that Jenica Atwin is leaving the Green Party ostensibly over a disagreement on the Middle East uh, policy and, and stance towards that conflict that she also doesn't seem to be on side with the liberal policy for. So it, that's the part that is a little bit bizarre to me, is that she's going to join a party that is actually aligned more with our enemy Paul's position than with the position that Jenica Atwin has put forward on this. So that alone is a little bit odd to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the conservatives are using this against the liberals. I think this is also just another sign of how we have issues, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia obviously came up this week. These are things that are very sort of difficult to discuss and they are things that are going to continue to come up um, that all parties are going to be facing in the next several months. We saw today now we, they've announced there will be an anti-Semitism summit in yeah. Canada to try yeah. and address the problem and the NDP are also calling for a summit to try and address Islamophobia in, in Canada. These are all sort of wrapped up in, in all of this but from the political perspective I mean I know there's also liberals that aren't necessarily comfortable with having Jenna Catwin join the caucus given her stance that doesn't seem to agree. She's used words that even the foreign affairs minister Mark Garno said today uh, do not align with anything that the liberals stand for. So there's a lot of explaining, yeah. explaining and uh, sort of positioning that I think we can still expect to come on this. Okay, we're running out of time. I'm going to ask the two of you a double barrel question. And the first one is an easy answer. And the second one is an interesting answer. Uh, are we going to have a fall election? And given that, what bills are you looking at? One or two bills that you're watching that stand a good chance of dying, significant bills that stand a good chance of dying on the order paper. Uh, start with you, Mia. Are we going to have one? And what are you watching for? At this moment, I'm going to say yes, but wait five minutes. I might change my mind because <laughs> this election is uh, d depending on, on my mood. Um, the major bill, of course, I'm watching is C-12, the Net Zero Act. It was something that the Liberals promised in the last election, waited really long to kind of introduce it until last fall. It's barely made it. To, it's only in the House of Commons committee right now. Uh, it seems very unlikely that it's going to get all the way through the Senate, even if Jonathan Wilkinson gets NDP support, uh, not not likely going anywhere uh, yeah. before the election. This, this is the bill which would spell out any future government would actually have road marks and, and reporting obligations in any, no matter what targets it sets for greenhouse gas emissions, etc. It would have targets. Um, Katie, what are you watching for? Are we going to have an election? What are you watching? I agree. I think that uh, if I had to, you know, lay a bet, I would say we're probably going to go to the polls sometime before, I'm going to say November. I think there's a, quite a large window between, say, an election that were to start maybe after Labor Day okay. for a mid-October vote. And you could actually see the House come back for a week or two and then break and then maybe, okay. uh, you know, early November vote. What? So there's different ways that that could play out. Okay. I would expect one before the end of the year. Um, as far as legislation, I think I'm kind of a vicarious masochist because I'm fascinated by the broadcasting over overhaul and sort of how how wrong that has gone for the government uh, profoundly at every level in terms of trying to get it through the house. It wasn't actually that controversial when it started. And then there yeah. was this decision to remove that clause on social media and that kickstarted what it has for the conservatives kind of gave them a, a center point for their rage and for their yeah. procedural tactic and for their ability to really glop up the affairs of the house for months. It's it's uh, for opposition parties. Okay. These sorts of battles can really be morale boosters. But yeah, and that's will, the one I'm watching. And we will 
watch that one too because that's going to be an interesting potential uh, election issue. I want to thank all three of you and uh, all three of you, all three of us. I want to thank both of you and uh, wish you a happy and safe weekend. Thank you, you, you too, too, Martin. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Martin Stringer. On behalf of all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching and have a great weekend.